What is up, engine heads? Welcome to another episode of Iconic Engines. It's been a while, right? Well, today we're back, and we're back with a real giant. And no, it's not a giant in the physical sense, because at only 1.8 liters and with just four cylinders, this engine is on the smaller end of the Iconic engine scale. But it's a real giant in the sense of the incredibly important role that it played and continues to play in the European, Brazilian, and many other mostly non-US tuning and aftermarket modifications scenes. This engine has graced the engine bay of what many believe to be the most disappointing Golf GTI ever, but thanks to its accessibility, ease of tuning, presence of force induction from the factory, and overall power potential, this engine pretty much single-handedly changed the perception of many enthusiasts of how easy it can be to make big power. Now Volkswagen is an interesting brand. If you're coming over from a Japanese or American manufacturer or whatever, you are probably used to a, uh, you know, clearly defined lines between your engines. Uh, let's say that you're a Toyota person. Uh, as a Toyota person, you have your four A's, your three S's, your two ZZ's, your one NZ's, whatever. All of these are four cylinder engines, but all of these have been developed separately and uh, key engine components cannot be swapped over from one engine to another. Uh, uh, in, other in other words, most car manufacturers employ what's similar to a cast system for their engines. Uh, the result is that there's no mixing and matching between the families. Compared to this, the Volkswagen Group 4-cylinder world is one big orgy. Trying to draw clearly defined lines between the engine families is next to impossible. And if you're unfamiliar with the Volkswagen system and you feel like being confused and overwhelmed, all you gotta do is visit a Wikipedia page called the List of Volkswagen Group Petrol Engines. Spend 15 minutes here and you're gonna know less about Volkswagen engines than somebody who has never visited this page. Apparently, it all started in 1974 with an engine called the EA111, uh, developed by a man called Ludwig Krauss. As you'll see, this is a very important man, but more about him later. Uh, now, Here's a problem. You scroll, uh, you scroll down a bit and you're going to find another EA111. This time it's in three-cylinder form uh, installed in cars made in the 2000s. And then you scroll down a bit more and then there's another EA111. This time it's a four-cylinder TSI slash TFSI engine uh, installed in even more recent cars. And then there's another 1.4 uh, that's also apparently based on the EA111. All of these engines are the EA111. I mean, different years, different number of cylinders, it's all EA111. But that's one type of problem. Here's another type of problem. Uh, let's try to find our engine, the 1.8 20 valve turbo. So let's scroll down a bit more 1.4, 1.5, 1.6, and here we are at the 1.8. So here we have a 1.8 R4 and then another 1.8 R4, and they have the same specs. And how do you differentiate between them? Yeah, whatever. Uh, now go down, and here we have our 1.8 20 valve turbo, and it has two engine codes, an EA827 and an EA113. So now instead of multiple engines having the same code, we have a single engine having multiple codes. Yeah, isn't that fun? So what is actually happening here? Well, don't worry, there is a way to make sense of all of this. And uh, to do that, you have to understand that all of these different codes and displacements and whatnot, it's all a lie, a big fat lie and an illusion uh, designed to confuse you because all of these different engines are pretty much the same engine. It's all one engine. And to understand how is that even possible, uh, we have to go back in time, back to the 60s and back to Mercedes. Huh? Mercedes? Aren't we talking about Volkswagen? Isn't this a Volkswagen engine? Well, yes, it is. But the grandfather of all of these four cylinders is actually a Mercedes engine. But before we get to Mercedes, we have to talk about Audi. Now, what we know as the four rings of Audi today was once something known as Auto Union AG. It was a merger of four vehicle manufacturers based in the German state of Saxony. And they were Audi, DKW, Hirsch and Wandera. And together, they became the second largest manufacturer of vehicles in Germany. 
But in 1945, the Second World War ended and the headquarters of Auto Union AG found themselves in Soviet occupied territories. And Soviets did with Auto Union what they did with most other companies uh, in their territory and they basically expropriated everything. They dismantled the plant and had the company removed from the commercial register of companies in 1948. Now, in order to save what was left of the company, Auto Union had to relocate, had to flee, basically, to West Germany. So they, they couldn't salvage much because they were basically running away. So they took mostly spare parts and relocated to the city of Ingolstadt, when they, where they decided to try and reestablish production. By the time the production could restart in 1950, only the DKB brand was actually functional because its products were cheap and easy to manufacture vehicles based on pre-war two-stroke engines. The Wanderer brand, which was a luxury brand, was extinguished and Audi and Hirsch were put on standby. Well, in 1958, this man steps on the scene. Friedrich Flick, a wealthy and important industrialist who was also a convicted war criminal, who served seven years in prison for financing the Nazi party during the Second World War. Well, after getting out of prison, he quickly re-established himself as the wealthiest man in Germany. But what's important for our story is that he uh, was a major shareholder both in Mercedes-Benz, which was known as Daimler-Benz back then, and in Auto Union. And he believed that the two companies could cover every market segment while at the same time cutting their development costs by sharing their technologies. So Mr. Flick managed to convince the board of Mercedes-Benz to buy Auto Union. But already by the early 60s, uh, it was obvious that the two companies, despite their merger, didn't really have a shared vision of the future. Uh, Auto Union was adamant to continue the production of two-stroke cars, uh, vans, and motorcycles, which were seen as, you know, obsolete, smoky, uh, primitive products without a future by the people over at Mercedes. So in 1963, Mercedes sends over this man. Ludwig Krauss, together with a team of highly motivated young technicians to set Auto Union straight. Now, Mr. Krauss, as the former head of the R&D and design departments over at Mercedes, uh, had extensive experience developing engines. And as soon as he got into Auto Union AG, together with his colleagues, he started work on the M118 engine, aka the Mexico engine, aka the H engine. The engine saw the light of day in 1965, and it featured a, for its day, incredible compression ratio of 11.2 to 1. It also featured high swirl intakes for better fuel atomization uh, to hopefully try and prevent knock at such a high compression ratio and also to improve fuel economy. The newly developed engine was installed in the new Audi 72. Originally, it was just known as the Audi, uh, but later the car was renamed to Audi 72, uh, with 72 representing the power output of the engine. The new engine was a radical and bold step forward, with the aim of taking Auto Union into a different, more modern future. In fact, to signal the parting with DKV's old smoky ways, all of Auto Union was renamed into Audi. And so Audi, as we know it today, with the four rings, was born, bearing an emblem which represents brands that no longer exist. Now, the new M118 engine attracted a lot of attention, and it also helped dust off the hibernating Audi. And even initial sales were pretty promising, but unfortunately, the shortcomings of the engine soon became evident. Trying to run a compression ratio of 11.2 with carburation and other technology from the 60s simply didn't work. The engines were really noisy, they vibrated a lot, and overall, they were pretty short-lived. In fact, with each new model, Audi would lower the compression ratio until they finally ended up with a much more manageable 9. Point one. But long before the success of the new engine could be reaped, Mercedes started parting ways with Audi. They weren't really happy with how things were turning out, and they also needed money to build a new truck plant. So they started selling their Audi shares. And guess who was buying? That's right, Volkswagen. Uh, their sales of their uh, air-cooled Beetle started declining after the omnipresent machine finally started to show its age. So they saw Audi as a great opportunity to pick up the much-needed know-how to propel themselves into a new age. By 1965, Audi had switched hands. It went from Mercedes to Volkswagen. But interestingly enough, Ludwig Krauss didn't go back to Mercedes. He stayed at Audi. And the successful and prominent engineer was given a new task, to redevelop the M118 engine into something more reliable and more competitive. 
And thus a new project was initiated to signify a new start and a split from Mercedes. The Mercedes code was dropped and the new engine called EA111. EA being Entwicklungsauftrag, which means literally translated development assignment. Yes, very inspirational. Now, uh, if you're coming over from a different naming convention from a different car manufacturer, you might be used to an engine code uh, meaning something. For example, the famous Toyota 2JZ GTE engine. Uh, this bunch of letters and numbers actually tells you something. It's the second generation of the JZ block. Uh, it has a performance cylinder head. It's turbocharged and it has electronic fuel injection. Compared to this, all the Volkswagen Audi Gruppe engines are, well, development assignments to be completed on time by the engineers. What do the numbers mean? Ha, the flux to feel my friend. Information on what the numbers actually mean is not available to the ally. <coughs> it's not available to the general public. In 1974, the new EA111 engine was introduced, first in the brand new Audi 50 and later under the hood of the first ever Volkswagen Pole. It proved to be a reliable and robust engine. It would later evolve into the EA827 and then into the EA113 and finally into the EA888. Now, together, these four engine families span 48 years of production. And if you recall, at the beginning of the video, I said that it's all the same engine. And I said this because at their core, they really are all the same. All of these engines are cast iron cylinder blocks. They all have 88 millimeters of spacing between their bore centers, and they're all 20 degrees inclined to the left, making them very similar to their grandfather, the M118 engine. So over the decades, there was never a radical change, no new blank canvas. In very typical Volkswagen fashion, its mainstay four-cylinder was always an evolution rather than a revolution. Now, our engine of interest, the 1.8 20 valve turbo, bears two engine codes because its production spanned two generations. It was introduced in 1993 under the hood of the Audi A4, and it received a pretty old warm reception because uh, it had a pretty low power output of 150 horsepower. Soon after, it would grace the engine bay of the Golf Mark IV GTI, again with only 150 horsepower, something that many saw as a shame to the GTI name. But in the years that followed, the Volkswagen Audi Gruppe would cram the 1.8 20 valve into pretty much everything it had on offer with four wheels. Uh, a total of 16 different cars got this engine, and the list includes everything from the small Polo and the Beetza to the hefty Superb and A6. And soon power output started growing as well, and the ubiquitous 1.8 would cover a power range from 150 to 240 horsepower. But by far the most significant achievement of this engine occurred after the warranty expired. In the tuning scene, the very widespread nature of this engine meant that for many a car with this engine was their first turbo car, but it was also usually their second car overall. Their first car being something suitable for a young person, usually something small, soul, and naturally aspirated, let's say a Fiat Punto 1.2. Now, many young enthusiasts on the quest for more power and thrills did try to tune their first small car. But as you know, tuning naturally aspirated engines isn't really that easy. It requires hardware changes, and that's a daunting task for a beginner in the world of tuning. Uh, for example, the first thing you usually try with a naturally aspirated engine is new camshafts. And to do that, you got to take the engine apart and then time it correctly. And, you know, even if you succeed or if you decide to pay a professional to install new camshafts, the end result was 1.2 horsepower at 7,200 RPM on cold mornings at sea level right before the harvest moon. And you will also lose 10 horsepower and 20 newton meters of torque at low RPM. So yeah, all in all, it didn't really work like it did in Need for Speed Underground. So after facing these disappointments, many enthusiasts would tire of their attempts to further torture the San Auto Punto and would sell it. And then looking on the used market, they would inevitably run into something with a 1.8 turbo engine. And when they purchased it, they would figure out that turbos are amazing and that tuning force induction engines simply doesn't bear nearly as many fruits of disappointment as natural aspiration. For many, the 1.8 turbo was the dealer that got them addicted to power, and 1.8 was a generous dealer. Its sturdy and robust nature, together with easily sourceable replacement and upgrade parts, meant that getting your first taste of big power was very much within reach. Even the lowest powered engines could easily be bumped up close to 200 horsepower with virtually zero hardware changes and zero getting dirty. All it took was something magical called a remap. 
The tuning scene would soon change forever, and Volkswagen's initially disappointing little four-cylinder would almost single-handedly breed an entire generation of power addicts, many of whom are still pushing this engine to ever greater heights, or if they're not, they're at least remembering it very fondly as their first forced induction lobby fan. As you will see in the spec section, this engine does not have the fancy components that you can find in more exotic power plants, but that's okay because it has something else which guarantees staying power, and that is simple, robust, proven hardware, which is often a more reliable path towards real-life, pragmatic fun and enjoyment. Now we have a bore of 81 millimeters and a stroke of 86.4 millimeters, giving us a pretty undersquare design, which by its nature results in good amounts of torque low in the rev range, but can also lead to a somewhat underwhelming top end. Now this is also one of the reasons why 5 valves per cylinder were employed, but more on that a bit later. Now the 1.8 turbo engine was produced from 1993 to as late as 2010 in some markets and it existed in many different models, different power levels as well as many different markets which means that there are many different variations of this engine. But there is a way to categorize all different versions and it involves using the art of the alphabet soup. The first major distinction is in the engine block, and there are two main types, the 058 and the 06A, which reflect a changeover from the EA827 to the EA113 family. Although there are many exceptions to this, in most markets 058 blocks are found in vehicles produced from 1993 until mid-2000. Uh, model years after mid-2000 all use the newer 06A block. Again, there are many exceptions to this. Uh, model year 2000 was a split production year, so you can find both 06A and 058 blocks in this model year. Like all EA827 engines, the 058 blocks have an internal intermediate shaft which drives the oil pump and they also have a water pump driven by an accessory belt. On the other hand, 06A blocks, like other engines in the EA113 family, do not have an intermediate shaft, and they have a water pump driven by the timing belt. The oil pump itself is chain driven by the crankshaft. When it comes to the compression ratio, we have a relatively modern and high compression ratio for a port injected turbocharged engine, and it's usually somewhere around 9.5 to 1 for all power outputs except the 240 horsepower version, which has a lower 9.1 to 1 compression ratio to accommodate the extra boost. When it comes to the internals, we have a forged, fully counterweighted crankshaft sitting in a cast iron block with five main bearings. Now, most crankshafts are forged, but some engines did come with cast units. However, both the cast and forged crankshafts are equally well suited to basic power upgrades, and forged is preferred only if more substantial power increases are planned. In general, the engines with the following codes, as you can see here, came with forged cranks, but there are, as always, some exceptions to this. The engine code is located on the top of the head near the oil filler cap, but to be able to use it as an accurate reference, uh, you have to be sure that the head is original to the block. The rods are also forged on most engines and have fracture split caps. The early 058 blocks used 20mm wrist pins, while the later 06A blocks used 19mm wrist pins, with the exception of the high power 225 and 240 horsepower engines, which used 20mm wrist pins. The pistons are cast aluminum on most engines, except for the high-powered versions, which use male forged aluminum pistons. Moving on to the cylinder head, we have another major distinction, and it's the port size. Early engines used the larger intake ports, which were later replaced by small ports across the entire range. Most engines are fixed cam timing, with the exception of some of the later engines, which featured variable valve timing, i.e. cam phasing, on the intake camshaft. The head features 5 valves per cylinder and dual overhead camshafts, however only the exhaust cam is directly driven by the timing belt. The intake cam is sort of a slave cam and it's driven by the exhaust cam via a chain at the back of the head. Now one of the reasons why 5 valves were used was to maximize the breathing area of the engine which is otherwise limited by the relatively small 81mm bore. Now the goal was to have both a torquey lower RPM and a lively upper RPM, uh, to which the 5 valves contributed positively. But like most manufacturers that used 5 valves, uh, Volks the Volkswagen Audi Group abandoned the design in the next generation of engines. One of the reasons being that having 5 valves in the combustion chamber does not leave enough room for direct injection. 
The valve sizes are 27mm for the 3 intake and 29.9mm for the 2 exhaust valves. The camshafts feature relatively mild profiles but are well matched to the turbocharged nature of the engine. Uh, the valves are actuated directly by the cams through a set of hydraulic lifters. We have coil over plug ignition and sequential port injection. Uh, most engines also feature an aluminum intake manifold paired with a cast log type exhaust manifold. There are three different KKK turbochargers fitted to the engines and they are the KO3, the KO3S and the KO4. Most engines feature the basic KO3 while the KO3S can be found on the following engines and the KO4 being reserved for the most powerful versions. Most of our powered versions run only around 0.6 bar or 8.7 psi of boost, uh, whereas the more powerful versions approach around 0.9 bar or 13 psi. Now one way for an engine to become iconic is to meet three important criteria. The first of these criteria is for the engine to be widespread and accessible and as we have seen the 1.8 turbo 20 valve engine was installed in pretty much every Volkswagen Audi Gruppe product save for caddies and vans. The second criteria is that the engine isn't overly complex uh, or expensive. If it were it would be prohibitive for enthusiasts to acquire it, work on it, repair it, maintain it and tune it. And as we have seen in the specs section the 1.8 engine is blessed with simple and proven components. The final criteria is ease of tuning and this requires the engine to be robust enough in order to sustain noticeable power increases without the need to open up the engine or do major hardware changes. It also must not be constrained with overly inaccessible ECUs which makes tuning restrictive or even impossible in some cases. And as you will see the 1.8 uh, engine also meets this criteria. In fact it does more and when it comes to ease of tuning it can be characterized as a true gem. Now the reason behind this is that even the lowest powered versions can see power increases of around 40 to 50 horsepower with pretty much zero or next to zero hardware changes. And this is because everything is already there from the factory. Uh, the engine is already turbocharged, the internals aren't weak, there are no major obstacles to reprogramming the ECU and all of the supporting stuff like the injectors, the fuel pump and the intercooler leave enough headroom for safely increasing power a bit. In fact, it's the lowest powered versions, the one with 150 horsepower, which are the most widespread and easiest and cheapest to acquire, that are usually the best candidates for increasing power by around 40 uh, to 50 horsepower. The higher powered versions that already have around 180 or even more horsepower are usually a bit more high strung coming from the factory, so seeing the same uh, power increases is exponentially harder on these engines. Now an exception to all of this uh, is the 150 horsepower engine in the Volkswagen Beetle, the new Beetle. Uh, this one comes with the smallest injectors and the smallest intercooler from the factory so seeing the same power bumps with an ECU reflash alone isn't really possible uh, with this particular engine. If you want to reach beyond 200 horsepower with a 150 horsepower engine as your starting point, the usual approach is to fit over components uh, from the higher powered versions at 225 or 240 horsepower engines. Uh, you're going to take stuff like the injectors and the KO4 turbocharger. Uh, most stock applications, the intercooler can stay um, up to about 250 horsepower, but it's usually going to result in inconsistent intake air temperatures for everything save for, I don't know, amateur drag racing, so that's best upgraded uh, as well. Slightly larger exhaust piping as well as a more free-flowing exhaust overall is also going to be necessary if you want to reach beyond 200 horsepower. All in all, various bolt-ons together with a good custom map can bring you to around 300 horsepower. If you want to go beyond 300 horsepower, you're going to need a larger aftermarket turbocharger, even bigger injectors, even bigger intercoolers, uh, a more powerful fuel pump, and so on. But uh, the important thing here is that the community teaches us that beyond 300 horsepower uh, is, is sort of the limit where the stock internals start becoming unsafe and are best upgraded. As with many other engines, the stock rods are the weakest link. Now the 058 box, the early box uh, and the higher powered versions feature 20 millimeter wrist pin rods and these are better suited uh, to high torque and high horsepower applications. However, if you want to reach well beyond 300 horsepower, these should be upgraded as well. If the rods are replaced with a set of aftermarket forged rods, then the rest of the internals can usually survive up to about 400 horsepower. Now, since you're already opening up the block to replace the rods, then it's a good idea to fit the set of OEM forged uh, Maui pistons that come in the high powered versions. But be warned, these are OEM pistons designed to meet uh, emission standards, which means that they have a pretty low rate of thermal expansion, which means that they cannot take the same sort of abuse that a set of aftermarket forged pistons can take, especially those uh, from the 
more ductile 2618 alloy. Although the stock crank is usually plenty strong, if you want if you want peace of mind beyond 300 horsepower, it's a good idea to ensure that the crankshaft inside your engine is forged. Another option is to fit the crankshaft from the later 2-liter TFSI engines. Uh, they feature a forged 92.8 millimeter stroke crankshaft, which bumps up the displacement to 2008 cc, and the crankshaft drops right in with minimal modification, thanks to the identical bore spacing of pretty much all the Volkswagen four cylinders. If you want to make more than 300 horsepower, power it's a good idea to use the large port head as your starting point because it can support the amount of airflow needed uh, to achieve larger horsepower uh, outputs also uh, the stock timing gear is considered a weak link so if you want to make big power it's a good idea to address this first but fortunately this is a well-known issue and there are many aftermarket solutions for it Beyond 400 horsepower, you're looking at some very, very big turbos. You're also going to need some cams, upgraded valves, uh, aftermarket forged pistons. You're also looking at billet, uh, aftermarket main caps, girdles, as well as a whole host of drive-on upgrades uh, to sustain all of this power. And there you have it, an engine which is truly one of the best friends that both a novice and an experienced tuner can have. Widespread, robust, simple, and a great aftermarket too. And now, as iconic engines tradition demands, some cringy rap. When you think iconic, I'm not the first engine that comes to mind. But that's okay, I understand. You're probably blind. Maybe you can't see the forest from all the trees. Maybe you think the only good engines are Japanese. I bet you put 2JZ in the search box one too many times. So just to be clear, let me drop some home country rhymes. Also, von España bis Czeska und auch Wolfsburgen in Golstadt, da weißt jedes Kind, was der 1,8 drauf hat. Kleines Motor, großer Turbo und ein Deutsch. Just Herz, Vollgas geben und du vergisst den Schmerz. Ich war dein erstes Turbo Benzin, du vergisst mich nie. Lass uns ewig jung sein, lang lebe die VW Magie.